Jolly good show, Major. Here we go again with another round of knee-jerk, over-the-top reactions to uh, something said that was ultimately minute and insignificant. And don't look now, but there is another PED scandal. Another PED scandal, and this time it's big. Thanks for tuning in. I am Rob English, your SoCal Seahawk, and this is another edition of Short Yardage. And we're going to get into some stuff real quick. I'm not sure how long this uh, this show is going to go because I just don't know how much I'm going to be able to how much I'm going to have to say about these topics. This one, I think I'll save what I would assume would be the best for last. Um, so with that being said, <clears throat> it made some news um, when Tom Cable, the offensive line and assistant head coach of uh, the Seattle Seahawks, our Seattle Seahawks, um, made a statement in the media uh, regarding Marshawn Lynch um, and Tom Cable's statements were to the effect of, uh, you know, Marshawn Lynch is going to have to adapt and adjust um, uh, to the Seahawks' new, new, new offensive, you know, mechanics. Um, a very simple statement. A very, very simple statement. He's going to have to adjust to the way the Seahawks are playing football now. To me, I hear that, and it doesn't, it doesn't shake, it doesn't shake my tree branch at all. Not a bit. It doesn't rock my boat at all. But in the realm of, you know, the experts, the ESPNs, and all those folks, they had a huge problem with it. And I'm speaking in particular about one particular show on one particular network. A guy that I typically find very agreeable, or I should say I'm very, that I typically agree with. I'm talking about one Stephen A. Smith, and I'm talking about um, uh, uh, First Take. He does the show with Skip Bayless and Molly Karam, I believe they say her name. Now, I am typically pro Stephen A. Smith. I am a Stephen A. Smith apologist, and don't even have to be a Stephen A. Smith apologist because typically he don't. I don't have find anything he I need to apologize for him about. Stephen A. Smith is typically spot on, and Skip Bayless is typically a buffoon. But um, this last uh, thing that I that I saw from these two gentlemen, uh, it was polar opposites. It was. Polar opposite. The, the question was, is there a problem? Do you have a problem with, uh, with Tom Cable's comments about Marshawn Lynch? And given the reality that Stephen A. Smith is so on point usually, I really gave, gave him the benefit of the doubt that he was going to answer this question correctly. <laughs> Wrong. This is the biggest, I mean, if you thought that last week there was too much made about Mike Pettin's comments about Russell Wilson, which was an exercise in, in ridiculousness, Mike Pettin simply said, hey, the dude ain't been around long enough to be considered as great as the guys have been doing it for years. He, that's basically what he said. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but that's what he meant. Oh no, he's just saying this and that, and that about Russell Wilson. No, give me a break. All Tom Cable said was, hey, he's been gone for a long time. He's going to have to adapt to what we're doing now. Makes perfect sense. Stephen A. Smith was up in arms about it. How dare Tom Cable talk like that about Marshawn Lynch? He's beast mode. Who is, who is Tom Cable? 
he's just some guy who had a had a head coaching job for two and a quarter seasons or two and three quarter seasons and has more losses than wins. You're a you're an assistant. You're an offensive line coach. Who do you think you are? How do you have the audacity to talk about one of your players who you have <laughs> Stephen A. maybe just for, for, forgot the fact that t- that Tom Cable's involvement in the Seattle Seahawks offense has quite a bit to do with Marshawn Lynch and his his associates at the running back position. Sometimes I think that I'm just kind of, you know, I, I, I dance for this stuff and I and I I think back. I'm like, am I giving this too much credibility? I know that they got to have something to talk about on TV. And in the radio and all the media, they have to have something to talk about. And it, are, are these folks just, you know, choosing to play the play that role? OK, this time I'll be that guy to talk about something ridiculous because we got to have something to talk about. Or, or are these, you know, these discussion, these shows that have these discussions, are they really giving their honest opinions? I'm sometimes torn about whether that's where they what it is. Are they really giving honest, honest opinions? Or are they just deciding to bring up a topic and somebody's going to take the idiot, the idiot road and someone's going to take the road of logic? Just so you can have enough material to fill up an hour block or however long your show is. I'm torn. I don't know which one is which. But Stephen A. Smith took the road of idiot on this one. And I, it hurts me to say it because I, I, I really, really like Stephen A. Smith, but I did not like this report. He asserts that the only reason that the Seattle Seahawks have been good up until now is because of Marshawn Lynch. The only reason we've been good is because of Marshawn Lynch. This is one of the few times I agree with Skip Bayless. I rarely agree agree with Skip. Usually I'm ready to just punch the TV on whatever spot Skip's face is on. Skip brought up a good point. Uh, he, he mentioned when it was his turn to speak after Stephen A went on his ridiculous rant, he said that of course Tom Cable has the right to say what he said. First of all, the right, I think that's a whole completely stupid argument. The whole argument is just dumb. The right, the only person who doesn't have a right to say anything is you, Stephen A. Smith. I mean, you, 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 come on, give me a break. That guy is the offensive line coach. Everything that Marshawn Lynch does when he has when he's on the field has something to do with Tom Cable. What do you mean he doesn't have the right to say anything? That's just retarded. But Stephen A. Smith uh, against what uh, excuse me Skip Bayless against what Stephen A. Smith said was if you look at it, yeah, Marshawn is going to have to ad- ad- adjust and adapt because Seattle has made history. By being able to win away from the running game. Now, when we got we got Thomas Rawls and Thomas Rawls did his thing and we weren't expecting that. No one really expected Thomas Rawls. To do what he did. No one can really say that. If you say it, you're not really being honest with yourself. You can't really say you expected Thomas Rawls to get out there and perform better than Marshawn ever did. Uh, you know, uh, recently anyway. No one expected Thomas Rawls to end up being in the at least close to being in the conversation about rookie of the year. No one expected Thomas Rawls to start flirting with a thousand yards in the season. No one expected Thomas Rawls to have the highest per carry average in the NFL during this time in during this time. So don't don't say you did because you didn't. But Russell Wilson has taken has seized control of this team. It's been thought of and this is something that I have not agreed with the entire time. But it's always been thought that this team belonged to Marshawn Lynch and the and the LOB. Marshawn Lynch and the Legion of Boom was the reason that this team has been doing so well. But if you look at it now, and I'm and I'm quoting Skip Bayless here, never thought this would happen. If you look at the Super Bowl. Last year's Super Bowl against uh, uh, New England. It was the worst thing ever had ever happened, according to everyone. That the ball was in the hands of one Russell Wilson or anyone else, for that matter, other than one Marshawn Lynch. 
But now, this season, you've got a quarterback who is squarely in the conversation for MVP. He's certain he's not he's not number one, but he's in the conversation about MVP. You see, you've all seen it. He's now become a player, become the player who you might want to have the ball in their hands in that exact same situation. The tides have turned in Seattle. It changed because it had to. Russell Wilson has become, has, 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 has made history this year. Russell Wilson has made history. Again, he's already done it before. He's done it again. Why would you not want the ball in Russell Wilson's hands right now in that same situation? So this team now belongs to Russell Wilson. Not Marshawn Lynch. And Marshawn Lynch is going to have to adjust to that. Now, I say all that. But really, for me, what it boils down to is just Marshawn Lynch getting back into the game. Because even with Russell Wilson playing the way he has played, it's not like we haven't been running the ball. Each of these games, we're still rushing for over over 100 plus. Okay, we're still running the ball. It's just that Russell Wilson is going off every week. And if you think about it, if you think about it, how is this not going to make life easier for one Marshawn Lynch when he gets back? If you think that we can run the ball with Dewan Harris, we can run the ball with Kristen Michael and Bryce Brown, okay, and, 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 and rack up nearly 200 yards on the ground. All right. If we can do that, imagine when Marshawn Lynch is back in the game, assuming that Marshawn Lynch comes back ready to roll. If Marshawn Lynch comes back not 100%, then that's a different story. If he's not if he's not ready to roll, then we might as well just keep Bryce Brown and uh, and um, uh, Chris and Michael in there. But if Marshawn Lynch comes back ready to go, and I mean ready to go, just imagine what he's going to be able to do, especially now because the passing game has proven so formidable. Marshawn Lynch is going to get out there and play some serious football. We might have another beast mode like the Saints game. So, um, yeah, uh, Marshawn having to adapt. uh, I don't even uh, the whole thing is kind of silly. Even even if I had a problem with what Tom Cable said, I'd say that the whole thing is silly anyway, because it's not like we're not going to run the ball. It's not like Marshawn's not going to see his carries. We still run the ball almost the same. So, yeah, kind of a silly thing there. And Stephen A. Smith just went on his tirade. Uh, it was terrible. Stephen A. Smith just just made himself look kind of silly. If you ask me, Marshawn Lynch's injury might be the best thing that could have happened uh, to the Seahawks this season. And some say that about Jimmy Graham as well. But it's true, but for different reasons. Jimmy Graham's injury um, provided Seattle to uh, an opportunity to get back to what they're used to doing. Uh, having Jimmy Graham on the field just it was it was a distraction in the way that you know you know you have something there that you're supposed to use, so you're looking at it more than just looking at everything in a fluid fashion. Without Jimmy Graham, everything just goes back to normal. It's all fluid. You look through everywhere. You find the things that are supposed to be there when they're supposed to be there. When Jimmy Graham's on the field, it's okay. I know where everything's supposed to be, but let me just give Jimmy an extra look because he's Jimmy. And that throws everything else off. That's the way I feel about it. Jimmy, Jimmy's presence on the field makes you think differently than you should. It's not organic. You, 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 you lose the organic, you know, uh, the organic play. 
Now, hopefully that can be made into, that can all become more cohesive and it can be look more organic by next season, hopefully. But you can't have a guy on your team who's there, who, who takes away that, that, that organic feeling. It has to be natural. If it's unnatural, it's not going to work. Jimmy Graham on the field is unnatural. When it works, it works. But a lot of times it doesn't because it's unnatural. So it was good that Jimmy Graham left because it went back to being natural. Marshawn Lynch's injury is good. Not for the same reason. We didn't go back to being natural. We actually had to break out of our our naturalness. We actually had to break outside of the box. We had to do something different. We had to spread our wings. We had to get pushed out of the nest and flap your wings and hopefully you can fly, Seahawk, fly. And you know what happened? Russell Wilson spread his wings and he is soaring. He is soaring right now. If Marshawn Lynch hadn't gotten hurt and Thomas Rawls hadn't gotten hurt, this may not have happened. This may not have happened. These these injuries, starting with Marshawn and then even counting Thomas Rawls, have these injuries have uh, have created an opportunity for one Russell Wilson to get out there and prove a point. And he is doing it time and time and time again, over and over again. He just keeps on doing it. So what does that mean? That means that Seattle is not just this run first team or this run only team that if you can figure out a way to stop Marshawn Lynch or stop their running game and keep, uh, keep Russell Wilson in the pocket, you can beat him. That's not the Seahawks anymore. The Seahawks are a team that they'll beat you with the run. And if they can't run, they'll beat you with the pass. Seattle has gotten better by the virtue of injury. That's real interesting. By the virtue of unfortunate happenings, the Seattle Seahawks have become a better team. So now when you bring Marshawn Lynch back, you bring our, our, our main man back to tote the football, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? The delayed run and the read option, I have a feeling when Marshawn Lynch gets back, so again, assuming, assuming he's 100%, I have a feeling that the delayed run and the read option, should we, should we start running it, are going to be so wicked. Are going to be so wicked. The, 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 the zone run, I mean, we're, we're a zone run scheme anyway. You know, we, we, we run power, but we run a lot of zone schemes. So, I, you know, that zone run is a bit of a delayed run. And I believe that this is going to, I think this is going to hurt teams. Um, this is, we are going to hurt teams in the postseason. I got a feeling Marshawn Lynch starts the game against Washington in the wild card round. I really do. We got better. And he's coming back fresh. That's the thing. He's coming, he, he's been sitting all this time. So at the very least, he's coming back fresh. Even if he's not a hundred percent, he's coming back fresh. That's legit. Why really have the Seattle Seahawks been so good over these last few years? Just piggybacking off my last, uh, my last little segment there. Is it beast mode? Is it the defense? Is it Russell Wilson? I guess the obvious answer, the general consensus is Marshawn Lynch and the defense. I've said it already, already in, in, in previous, uh, previous, um, editions of the show, previous shows. It's not Marshawn Lynch. And it's not as much to do with the defense. If this season isn't a perfect example of why that's the case, I don't really know what is. I've been saying, I have proof on video 
<laughs> on YouTube me saying it. The reason the Seattle Seahawks are as good as they are, have been as good as they are, is because of Russell Wilson. And no, I know it's not because Russell Wilson was going out there throwing for 5,000 yards and 25, you know, and 35, 45, 55 touchdowns or however many. He wasn't, he wasn't setting any records in yards and touchdowns, except for, you know, when did it, you know, as, uh, as a rookie. But that's not why Russell Wilson is not because of his touchdowns and his yards. It's from things more like his completion percentage. But not even, not even so much his completion percentage. It's for things like, like this season, Russell Wilson was sacked quite a few times. He led the league in sacks taken by a pretty wide margin. I'm not even sure what the number is now. But Russell Wilson was leading the league in sacks taken by a pretty wide margin. But that is a good thing if you look at it. Okay, if you look at it objectively. If you look at it relatively speaking. Because relative to Russell Wilson trying to do too much to avoid those sacks. And fumbling the football, throwing interceptions. Taking those sacks wasn't so bad. At least if you take the sack, no matter how many sacks you take. All right. And now, now in, in obviously, you have the option to throw the ball away. But plenty of bad things have happened to players trying to throw a football away. And Russell throws a football away when he, whenever he can. Russell never misses the opportunity to throw a football away. But when you're trying to do too much and you're throwing, I mean, imagine if, if trying to do too much, Russell Wilson threw a few more picks and had a few more fumbles. Where would we be in this, in this season? Where would we be? We wouldn't be where we wouldn't be sitting looking to lock up the five seed right now. I guarantee you that. Now stretch that over, over the course of the last four years. How many more games do you think we've won because of that? And Russell Wilson is nothing new. It's nothing new for him taking sacks. Russell Wilson has been so good for us because of the things that he doesn't do, not because of the things that he does. And for the things that he does as well. But you have to consider the things that he doesn't do. He doesn't turn the ball over. He doesn't make silly mistakes. He doesn't do RG3 stuff. He doesn't do. Teddy Bridgewater stuff. He doesn't do Johnny Manziel stuff. Johnny Manziel scored a touchdown against our defense, throwing across his body, running to his right, throwing to his left. He scored a touchdown. But I want to say it might have been Jeremy Lane, who if he just had another step, he would have picked that ball off and that would have been going back to the house. Now, I'm not faulting. I'm not even talking mess about Johnny Manziel when I'm saying that because you know, Brett Favre, there'll never be another quarterback like Brett Favre, but Brett Favre made a career out of throwing, of making throws just like that. And, and Brett Favre has the NFL record. Okay. And in, in, the interceptions thrown, no one's thrown more interceptions than Brett Favre. But he's also going to be a Hall of Famer. But Russell Wilson is efficient. And efficiency is productive. He may not be over, he may not be 5,000 yard productive, he may not be 50 touchdowns productive, but efficiency is productive. And Russell Wilson, uh, Russell Wilson is absolutely efficient. And now, not only is he efficient, he's over the top productive. You could have plugged any running back, and I, I, I'm, I'm I'm giving that a stretch. That's a stretch when I say any. That's I'm stretching it when I say any. So bear with me, okay? For shock value, I'm gonna say any. But you could have plugged any running back into Seattle's and Pete Carroll and 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 Daryl Bevel's system in these last four years, and Seattle would have been 
just as good, at least comparably as good. The scheme, the philosophy, but also because Russell Wilson was going to keep them in the game by not making mistakes. One way or another, RW3 was going to get you there. That's what's going on. The defense, the defense has played well. Defense has played well, but the defense is there to stop the other team from scoring, but, but the defense is, but other teams are going to score and we still have to match those scores. Look at the games where teams did manage to score. Look at the reality that Seattle has not lost a game by more than, I believe, a touchdown or 10 points. I, I had I had the stat in my head and, it, and it, it escapes me now, but I believe it's either, either 8 or 10 points in forever. I don't know how long it's been, but it's been a long time. How about the fact that we've led in the fourth quarter in every single game, even the ones we lost, but we've had a fourth quarter lead. It's uncanny what Russell Wilson's been able to do. We've, we've, look at the Pittsburgh game. And this doesn't tell a story. I mean, I don't know what does. Look at the Pittsburgh game. It was a, it was a shootout. Seattle's not supposed to be able to win shootouts. Right? Seattle is not supposed to be able to win shootouts. No. If you can, if you can score more than 25 points on the Seahawks, you beat the Seahawks. Right? That's the general, that's, that's the general consensus. That's what people, that's the, the word on the street around the NFL. If you can score more than 25 on Seattle, you beat Seattle. But you have to do that. You have to score 25, which is no walk in the park. No, 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 my friend. If you want to try and put up a 40 burger, we're going to go put up a 40 burger. RW3 is going to give you your 40 burger if you need him to give you a 40 burger. Russell Wilson is the key and I will, I will debate it with anyone who wants to. The reason that the Seattle Seahawks are where we are is because of one number three. Without Russell Wilson, this ship don't even leave the dock. Don't even leave port. Or it might, but it ends up like a Titanic. Okay, folks. So, here's the real deal. There is a new report from Al Jazeera. About, I mean, and this is just terrible timing. It seems like that there's, there's somebody out there who is trying to take the NFL down. Like someone is trying to take down the NFL. Who is it? I don't know, but someone's doing it. There's some, there's someone, by, there's some force behind this. There is some force behind this. They are trying to take down the NFL. It's gotta be a conspiracy. I want to get to the bottom of it. First, we have the concussion movie. Right? We have the concussion movie that's going to come out. Well, it's already come out, excuse me. And people are going to go watch that movie and change. I, I talked to a friend of mine. Not a football fan. Not a football fan. But she wouldn't saw a concussion. And I just, you know, nonchalantly asked her, I said, you know, hey, so do you hate the NFL now? And she's like, no, I don't hate it. But I definitely think about it differently. It seemed like an innocent enough comment. But when you, if you really look, if you just really kind of dig into that, to that statement. A person who isn't even a football person whatsoever. My friend Maria, she, she, she is not a football person, person at all. But even she can make the statement that she now thinks differently about the NFL after watching Concussion. It's like the movie Inception. 
you gotta you you put you put that little prick that little just that little spark of an idea in someone's head and they do the rest they do the rest and in the case like my friend you just put that spark just that spark that says well I think differently about it now and then when she has kids she doesn't have any kids but when she has kids and she has a son who wants to play football what's the first thing she's going to do besides recall back to the movie concussion that she watched back in December of 2015 and her decision is going to be based on that that's powerful that's powerful. So you have the concussion movie. Now, Al Jazeera has released the report of a, I think it was a seven, eight or seven or eight or nine month long investigation into PED usage in, in, in many major sports, but uh, specifically the NFL. It's kind of funny that a supposed hurdler, an Olympic hurdler named Liam Collins from Great Britain is going to take down, is, is, go, is looking to take down the NFL or take down, you know, probably, I guess, all sports, I suppose. It's just kind of weird. I when you think of some some guy from Great Britain is going to take down the greatest American sport. Liam Collins uh, is a is a, uh, a, 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 a previously a, a, a Olympic sports star. He was a track star. Got into some trouble um, with real estate, I believe, or something like that, and um, ended up owing a whole lot of people money and went bankrupt. So he got in a lot of trouble. Um, Al Jazeera and this guy come together. Um, and he is under the guise of a athlete, of an athlete, excuse me, who is trying to get back in. He wants to run for the Olympics. So he's playing the role of the guy who's trying to you know, beat the odds. He was in it for a minute, had a had a great fall. He's trying to get back on the get back on the horse again. He has to play this role because he is going to infiltrate the world of PEDs. The doctors, the physicians, all those folks. To get information. And then expose everything that he finds. Liam Collins, as part of his investigation, um, connected with a man named Charlie Sly, a pharmacist um, out of Austin, Texas. This pharmacist from Austin, Texas, apparently, and I've seen part of the video, and I'm going to watch the rest of it, but apparently admitted, and it was recorded unknowingly on tape, uh, uh, admitted that uh, he has worked with many athletes. One of those athletes, <laughs> the one and only Peyton Manning, the sheriff, the golden boy of the NFL, Peyton Manning, says they have, they delivered or, or sent who knows how, how much amounts of HGH to the Peyton, to the Peyton Manning household, to the Manning household under the name of Peyton Manning's wife. Her name escapes me right now. Alyssa Manning, something like that. Unbelievable. Many other names are dropped. James Harrison, one-time uh, Pittsburgh Steeler. Clay Matthews, 
Green Bay Packers. Julius Peppers. And other players. The whole story is about how easy it is to beat the system, beat the testing system. If you, if you, if you're smart and your physician is smart, uh, the, the, the really, you know, the, the drugs they're using and everything are designed to beat the system. And it's easy to do as long as you do it right. One of the statements in the, in the report is, it's all but impossible to catch these guys who are using performance enhancing, enhancing drugs unless you investigate them. The ones that you do catch, I guess, are the unlucky ones or the, or the sloppy, lazy ones. But everybody's doing it. And the reason they're not caught is because they're doing it right. And there really is no way to catch everyone unless you actually investigate. The testing is not enough. This story just sickens me. And I'm not saying I'm pro PEDs. But I'm not anti PEDs. Now, if that sounds like a, like a contradictory statement, let me further explain. I don't believe that it's necessary for all the things to be banned that are banned in the NFL. There, there doesn't need to be bans on all the things that are banned. Adderall, Richard Sherman and, and Brandon Browner got into some stuff about Adderall a couple years ago. Adderall. Now, I've taken Adderall before, and it wasn't prescribed to me. <laughs> I've taken Adderall before. Now, Adderall does definitely make you attentive, for lack of better words. It gets you up. But it's not like it's not like it's crack cocaine or even meth. It's a legitimate pharmaceutical drug. I know it's been it was it's created for a purpose, but I mean I'm I say all that to say like I mean come on there's there's all kinds of what is it Torball or Tor I, I can't remember the names. But there's, there's, for instance, they mentioned Clay Matthews uh, in in part of the report who was look, reaching out to one of these pharmacists um, for for a drug that is simply a painkiller. It's a high powered painkiller, but it's illegal. But it's just a painkiller. This isn't even something that's supposed to make him run faster or 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 you know or jump higher. It's just a painkiller, but it's illegal. And if that got caught in his system, he gets suspended. He gets in trouble. This guy bangs his body at 100 miles an hour against multiple people, multiple times, multiple days of the week for a good portion of the year. And all he wants is a painkiller and you're going to and you're going to fine him and get and, and and chastise him and give him the give him the nth degree for it now i'm not saying these guys should be out there doing anabolic steroids you know like you know you like, like you know and it's really weird to me because in certain sports like bodybuilding there's bodybuilding leagues you know where you can be unnatural you can pump up all the whatever you want as long as you don't get caught actually acquiring the drugs you can use them all you want you know, and I'm not saying that I want that for football, but I do, I do think that the rules are a little bit too strenuous. It's, it's, it's almost unnatural to not expect these players who are doing, playing this game for their livelihoods to not need to gain a competitive edge. These are the best players in the world. There's only 32 teams in the NFL. 32. There's only 53 guys, okay, on an active NFL roster. Only 53. 
So you have a little over, a little under 1,700 people. That's less than 2,000 people on the planet that are good enough to play in the NFL. Now, I'm sure there's other people out there who, who, you know, could play or who are good enough, but they aren't playing. They aren't playing. So you have to assume that they're not good enough, even though they are. There's a little under 1,700 people in the NFL at any given time who are good enough to be on the 53-man roster of one of the 32 teams in the NFL. You know how many people there are on the planet? You know how many people there are in the country? You know how many people there are in the state of California? You know how many people there are in the city of San Diego? Or Seattle? Only 1,700 people are good enough to play in the NFL. You're going to need a competitive advantage, a competitive edge. So um, I disagree with the strenuous rules against performance enhancing drugs. Um, you know, I don't I'm not saying that they all they should be able to do whatever they want, but there should be more of a comprehensive look into this, into what these drugs actually are and how serious they are. And not everything should be banned. Not everything should be banned. If you look at Peyton Manning. The report is that he was um, involved in this around 2011, uh, just after his neck surgery. Just after his neck surgery. You think about it. A guy who's been to the height of NFL success. The height of NFL success. Before he injures himself. And a, a, a legitimate serious in, uh, injury, a serious injury that many would consider a career ending injury. But no, no, not for Peyton Manning. They said, Peyton Manning, dude, you broke your neck, bro. When Peyton Manning put his helmet back on and was walking on the football field, people are like, what is he doing? He's going to get he's going to get hit by somebody. And his head's going to fall off. He just broke his neck. A guy who wants to solidify his legacy in this league has the opportunity to come back. Just take a little HGH. HGH is what they're saying that he, that he took. Human growth hormone. What's the problem? A lot of these things that are banned are substances that help with the recovery to get you able to be ready to play on time. These men, these gladiators put themselves, and yeah, they're getting paid lots of money to do it, but that doesn't mean that they don't want to do it as long as they can. The problem with the whole um, steroids thing is, well, one other problem with it is that people get caught. You got to own up to it. If you're going to do it, do it. But if you do it, own up to it. Because innocent people, well, I'd, I'll call them innocent people, lose their jobs when you don't. Ryan Braun or Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong was coming off cancer. <laughs> cancer. Makes perfect sense why he would take drugs. PEDs, they're not drugs, PEDs. But when you deny, when you completely and adamantly deny Any notion that you are guilty 
of such uh, offense. It calls into question the practices of the people whose job it is to catch you for these offenses. And these people lose their jobs because you don't tell us an American hero has done something wrong unless you are absolutely sure and can absolutely prove that you are absolutely sure that he did something wrong. And if you do make the mistake of telling us that, a, that an American hero, if you make them, if you choose, if you make the mistake, you tell us that an American hero screwed up and they can find any hole in your explanation. You are out of here. That happened with the folks involved in Lance Armstrong's case. It happened with the folks involved in Ryan Braun's case. People lost their jobs, their credibility. Just to find out that the guys were guilty. Just to find out they were doping it up the whole time. If you're going to do drugs, admit to it. If you get caught, do your time for doing your crime. Don't don't take out everyone with you on your way out. So we'll see what's going to happen with this. Uh, this is going to be very interesting. Uh, what's going to happen with this whole PED thing? Because right now, um, I'm going to watch the whole video um, and 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 see <laughs> what the whole, all the details are and whoo. This could be, uh, this could be huge. You got, I mean, it just seems like the NFL has been going downhill the last couple of years. You got Adrian Peterson getting in trouble for whooping his kid, which is ridiculous. Which was ridiculous. Yeah. He, oh, I won't, I won't get too far in that. I don't want to get too far in that. That's a whole other thing. You got Ray Rice for knocking out his wife. Right. I mean, PR stuff just <laughs> everywhere. And now you got the concussion movie. And now this big PED scandal, a lot of players from a lot of sports. Huge, huge. They're trying to take us out. Somebody's trying to take us down. I don't know who it is, but I don't know what their problem with the with the sports culture is, but they're trying to do it. Seahawks at Rams kick off 125 Sunday. I will talk to you guys afterwards. This is Rob English, your SoCal Seahawk. Thanks for listening. Go Hawks.